Welcome, everybody, to another Our Universe Revealed. Um, new faces in the audience, which is always wonderful to see. Um, I'm Jonathan Crass. I'm a professor in the physics and astronomy department at Notre Dame. The astronomy part is new in the title, so we're still getting used to it. Um, but I am sort of one of the hosts of the Our Universe Revealed series. So as we go through the fall, there's going to be a series of talks. Two weeks ago, we had a talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. If you're interested in seeing that and weren't able to make that, if you go to our website, nduniverse.org, um, there's a YouTube link there, and we have the recording of that now on the website. So you can go back and watch Professor Chris Houck, who uses data from James Webb to study galaxies, to hear all about that. He talked about a lot of the pictures and some exciting things that have come out from that. Um, so you can also sign up for our mailing list there as well. So if you want to know more about the talks, um, you can sign up to our mailing list on the website there. Tonight, we're not... Well, we could perhaps be looking up at the universe in a different way than we were talking about two weeks ago. Not using telescopes directly, but looking at the particles of the universe. And Professor Mike Hildreth, he is a professor in physics and astronomy as well at Notre Dame. He's also the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the College of Science at Notre Dame. Um, so that means he sort of is in charge of and oversees a lot of the research activities that are done in science at Notre Dame. Um, he's also a particle physicist. So talking about things that you might have heard of, the Higgs boson, the God particle as it was nicknamed. And when he sent me this title, I got quite excited about that because I think people have the stereotypical idea that scientists, we sit in our office or in a laboratory working all on our own. And science today is not like that at all. And he is part of one of the most international, one of the largest collaborations in science. So CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, over in Europe, is a huge particle accelerator, and Mike is a key part of the American team of that. So he's going to talk all about that project, the challenges of working in big science teams, the benefits of working in big science teams. So let's give him a nice, warm welcome this evening. Is this working? Can you hear me okay? I also sing so I can project over this microphone if, uh, if, if need be. Okay, so thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I love the venue, so I'm very pleased to uh, bring science to downtown South Bend. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. And it's not just me, as Jonathan just told you. It's uh, uh, me and about 3,000 of my closest friends uh, work on these projects. And um, so I'm going to give you a little story of what the science is that we're trying to do and how we do it. And uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun along the way. So uh, let's start with, is this, I should turn this on. OK, so I'm going to start with the ancient Greeks. So at, at the time of the ancient Greeks, we had the idea, even as early as the 5th century BC, that matter might be made out of something indivisible. And they actually came up with the word atom way back then. And so we've been talking about atomic physics maybe for uh, the last 7,000 years. Uh, these are two of the uh, stellar thinkers of the time. Um, and then <coughs> they were trying to understand how all of that matter was put together. And so they had the idea of the four, depending on whether you count ether or not, the four building blocks of matter, fire, air, water, earth, and then maybe there's this other ether thing that's sort of questionable. Um, so if we were to draw the world's first periodic table, it would look like this. And so we've got four elements. And uh, yeah, maybe there's ether here in the center. I don't know whether that's the sun or what. But anyway, you've got fire, water, air, and earth. OK. so. That was their view of what the universe was made out of. Now, they couldn't actually do any experiments to prove this, but it was, it was natural philosophy in some sense. OK, so now we jump to a more modern representation of our understanding of the structure of matter. This is due to Mendeleev in 1869. And how many of you have taken high school chemistry? OK, quite a, quite a few. So you probably remember that the organization of this table has something to do with atomic structure. And so just to make it, I'm a particle physicist, so I have to simplify everything. So, so our view of what an atom is, so this, this would be helium. Uh, we've got some heavy things, like protons and neutrons in the middle. And then we've got electrons whizzing around on the outside. 
And then how, how the electrons pair up and how they're organized determines the structure of how the different elements relate to each other. Now this is hideously complicated. Um, you know, I'm a particle physicist, so this, 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 even this is too complicated for me. Okay, so, so this is really, really complicated. So there's a richness to this structure that's built out of these very fundamental building blocks. So that's a, a theme. Um, okay, but I want to take you down the, the subatomic uh, history here. So this is approximately 1920. We'd figured out that there were protons and neutrons and electrons and positrons, actually. Uh, no, positrons came a little bit later. Um, and so we can try to sort of understand so these were our building blocks of matter in, at that time period. Okay, then things got more complicated as people did experiments uh, using cosmic rays raining from the sky or building new particle accelerators, they found all these other things. Now this is, was really confusing because we thought that these were our basic building blocks and now we find all these other particles, including this one here, which is kind of special. Um, and no one really understood how to make any sense of this because it looked really arbitrary. So people thought really hard and some really smart people came up with the idea that there was actually a pattern to the way that these particles were constructed. And it turned out that pattern was due to the fact that these are not fundamental particles. They instead have other little fundamental particles inside of them called quarks. And so all of these things, which were discovered up through the 1950s, were composed, in fact, of only three fundamental particles. You just put them together in different collections. As, and, and this was sort of thought of in about 1960. It took a little longer to actually prove it. And so really what you've got is these little quarks running around here in different combinations that build these other things. So richness of structure from a small number of fundamental constituents. Okay, so those were the quarks. And so now we have a new paradigm. We have new subatomic particles. And so we can start to build a universe from them. And so as about 1968 or so, these are the particles that we know, uh, we knew at that time. So we have uh, quarks in orange, um, other kinds of particles in yellow and green. I'll talk a little bit more about how these all fit together in just a second. And the, again, these organizing principles of trying to put like with like led people to kind of group these things. And then from this, we try to write down a theory to understand how these particles interact. So as we go forward, what we're going to be doing is probing whether this theory is correct or not and trying to measure all the different interactions and trying to understand how they fit together. So this whole science of particle physics is trying to understand the fundamental building blocks of the universe, um, and they'll multiply a little bit here in a second, and the forces that hold them together, and trying to understand where that came from. That's the hard part. So first we have to figure out what the building blocks are and how they interact with each other. So as a, as a, as a, in about 1973, this was the picture. So the orange things here and the ones that I'll add in a second are the things that go inside of protons and neutrons and other, other things that, are, that like go in a nucleus. These particles down here, like the electron, I showed you it orbiting the nucleus to make the atoms, they have heavy friends. So there's a muon and in a minute I'll add another one. These are just heavier copies of the same thing. And then there's some other stuff. The electromagnetism, so we, we, we write down, um, when we write down the theory of these forces, we postulate that there are particles that mediate the forces. So the photon is responsible for electricity and magnetism of the, the force between charged particles. Okay, so now things got more complicated. We realized that there were other processes in nature. For example, there had to be something to hold these quarks together to make protons and neutrons, otherwise they would fly apart. So there has to be a strong nuclear force. People started seeing radioactive decays. And so that meant that these things could change back and forth. So there had to be another kind of force, which we call the weak nuclear force, that, that mediates that kind of interaction. We all know about gravity. Um, and so gravity kind of comes along for the ride here for a little while. Okay, and so then as people started to think about this, then if there are new forces, there must be new particles to mediate those forces. So we have a gluon, which glues the quarks together. And we have these other W and Z things, which are really kind of complicated and are responsible for mediating the, the radio, for causing radioactivity in some sense. Um, they're important particles, um, and they're also really heavy, so that's another mystery. Okay, so, and then a little bit later on, uh, we found that there were some other things to fill in the picture. So now 
we actually discover that there are, and so this time needs to advance a little bit, the top cork was found in 1995. Um, so we filled out this picture, so now there are three pairs of each of these particles. And we have no idea why, actually, but that, that's what nature tells us. Um, and so we're going to forget gravity. Gravity is not a part of quantum field theory. We don't understand how gravity fits in with anything else that we're talking about. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to ignore it, forget it, forget it, pretend it's on vacation. Uh, we'll come back. We won't come back to it later because we have no idea how to fit gravity into this picture. Um, it, it is a force, and you feel it probably better than any other force that you know about, but we have no idea how to fit it with all this other stuff that I'm talking about. Um, the other thing that happened is that people understood that the photon, the W, and the Z bosons are actually different manifestations of the same f interaction, and they're related to each other. And so this is called the elect we now call this the electroweak interaction instead of electric electricity and magnetism and a separate weak interaction. To make this work, we had to introduce a new particle. That's called the Higgs boson. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about how this works uh, later. But the Higgs is also, it turns out, responsible for giving masses to all these things and for the fact that the photon has no mass and these things are like 90 proton masses. It's like incredibly heavy. But they're part of the same interaction. So this is, so the Higgs actually breaks the, uh, this up so that the photon can have no mass and these are really heavy. I'll explain kind of how that works too. So this is the picture of the full, our full understanding of how these particles exist and how they interact. And this actually was put together in about 1973. As of today, we've actually found all of these things, which is great. Um, and we're still trying to understand how this all fits together. So I'll t I'm going to tell you about the Higgs boson discovery. So it was the last piece that we found. And people have been looking for it since, well, since before I was born. Uh, and so probably for many of you, your lifetimes, this has been a defining goal of particle physics, which you probably didn't hear about until we actually found the thing 10 years ago. So let me just give you a quick timeline. So Peter, H Peter Higgs wrote down his uh, famous theory. Some other people were thinking similar thoughts along the same line, but I think his was probably the most complete treatment. They wrote, that was written down in 1964. It was probably ignored for a little while until the other theories that showed how everything could fit together were all written down. But from about, from about the 1980s onward, people were bi building particle accelerators to try to find this thing, to see if the, this theory was correct. So uh, the Tevatron, um, which is this collider here, which is outside of uh, Chicago, how many of you have been over to Fermilab? Um, so that was built uh, in part to find the Higgs boson, but also to, it discovered the top quark. Um, and then at, in CERN, in Geneva, Switzerland, there were two accelerators. One is the a Large Electron-Positron Collider that I worked on uh, as a postdoc. And then the, LA, the Large Hadron Collider, which is where we're running now. And so all of these machines were built to try to find the Higgs. Um, the Tevatron came close. The LEP actually came close, too. If it had a little more energy, it would have been able to get there. And so it took until uh, 10 years ago, from 1960, to actually discover this particle. So uh, July 4th, 2012, this was announced. Um, and uh, here are some of the luminaries. Uh, this is the Director General of CERN at the time. This is Peter Higgs. So anyway, this was a huge uh, moment, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how the discovery kind of unfolds. So we found this new particle. Now, it could be pretty much anything. So first, you have to start to measure its properties. And so one of the things that followed shortly thereafter was the first measurements of how the Higgs gives mass to particles. And I'll explain how this works in a minute. But it turned out that uh, it was consistent with a Higgs boson. There could be more. We still don't know. Um, but we, we learned a lot by those initial measurements of, the, of, the, of its properties. And so in short order, I think that's probably one of the, the, from the original paper to the Nobel Prize, it was many, many years. But from discovery to Nobel Prize, that's a pretty quick turnaround. So uh, Engler and Higgs won the Nobel Prize uh, the following year after the discovery. So one of the things that I'll talk about then is like, you know, OK, we have to celebrate. Um, I keep forgetting that that's there, so anyone do that again. Um, and so one of the things that I'll, you know, here we are 10 years hence. What, what's next? What are we actually doing at the Large Hadron Collider? And, and what, is, what is the future of this particular science? So I'm going to try to address that as well. 
OK, so why is the Higgs boson so important? And this is, you can express this in one picture. So without the Higgs boson to give mass to the particles, then everything that I just showed you in that periodic table would be massless, which means it would travel at the speed of light, which means that you would never get quarks together to form protons, which means you'd never have hydrogen atoms, which means you'd never have any elements at all. And so all you would have in the universe, instead of this beautiful picture of the Milky Way, trees, lakes, whatever, would be just, just basically light. So we wouldn't have a universe if there was no Higgs boson. So that's why it's important. So <laughs> why do they call it? So why do they call it the God particle? So you have to blame. So Leon Lederman was um, a former director of Fermilab, a Nobel Prize winner himself, discovered the bottom quark, one of those things that I showed you in the periodic table. And he wrote this book called The God Particle, which, you know, it, 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 uh, people were really annoyed by this, actually. But so it was a, it was a, it was a good selling book. But the, when we're talking about the Higgs discovery, this is over and over and over called the God particle. So our reaction to this is more like this, <laughs> that we just really are fed up with this. <clears throat> so we use it as titles of talks to draw people in, but we're actually not really fond of kind of calling it the God particle. But anyway, OK. So what does this thing do? So let me try to explain a little bit about how the Higgs boson gives masses to particles. And it works kind of like this. This is my, I also sail, so this is my sailboat analogy. So imagine that you go to, probably Lake Michigan is a little extreme. You go to some lake nearby here. Uh, I sail up in Edwardsburg, and on, often on the weekends you could find uh, uh, flotillas of boats racing. They're all the same, because every, we race same against same. So imagine that you go out and you see a bunch of boats. They have different colors, but they look pretty much the same. But you notice when the wind blows, Maybe one of the boats goes really fast, and the other, maybe one just doesn't move at all. And so you have a different, uh, when the wind exerts a force, you get a different acceleration from each boat. And you're like, well, this is weird. Why does that happen? And then at the end of the day, when you see them pull the boats out of the, out of the lake, you see that maybe the purple boat has no keel at all. Maybe that was the one that went really fast. The sort of teal boat here has sort of a normal keel. And maybe they just lashed a log or something underneath that orange boat to keep it upright. So that's going to go really slow. And so you can imagine that if I have the same wind blowing on these boats, but they have different keels, that they're going to move with different speeds. And effectively, the coupling, represented by the keel, between the boat and the lake determines the effective mass of the boat. The orange one has a very high mass because when I push on it, it doesn't move at all. So it's like it's really heavy. Whereas the purple one will just scoot right along. So it doesn't take much force to move it. So the, cu the, the coupling through the keel determines the effective mass of the boat. So when we think about the Higgs boson then, and the Higgs particle, so it turns out there are two things. There is the Higgs field, which permeates all of space. And all of the particles that we know and love swim in. So the Higgs field is the lake. So the Higgs field is the thing that actually gives mass to the particles. So just like the lake and the keels give mass to the boats. The Higgs boson, the thing that we can actually discover, turns out is we call it an excitation. It's like a wave on the surface of the lake. So if I whack the lake with an oar, I make a wave, and that's my Higgs boson. So it's, it's like it's made out of the same stuff that the lake is, but you have to whack the lake to make the boson to discover it. And so you were asking me earlier, how can this be if it permeates all of space? And so you have to put enough energy in to make a wave to be able to see it. And so this, this thing, uh, just like um, the speed of sound, it has a, a speed that's characteristic of the medium. And so it has an energy to excite it it's, that's characteristic of the medium. And that turns out to be heavy. So you need to whack it with a lot of energy to make this. But the, the lake is always there. And so it turns out, if we see the Higgs boson, this wave, then there must be a lake. And so this tells us that the Higgs field exists. And so the Higgs field is what gives mass to the particles. And so that's the, that's the sailboat analogy of the, of the Higgs boson. Um, OK. So, so far, this seems to work. And I'm not going to really explain this graph except to say that all of these on the dotted line here is the expectation of what 
the, the masses, if you will, or the, the strength of the Higgs, the, the, these are the, this is measuring how, how the keels work on this axis, and these are the masses of the particles. And if the Higgs theory is right, then this dotted line would go through all the particles, and so far it does. Now the error bars are pretty big, so we're still working our way through that. But so far, it seems like this is the right, it, it behaves like a Higgs boson. Okay, so how do we actually do this? So um, this is the picture of the Large Hadron Collider. It's near Geneva, Switzerland. Here's Lake Geneva. This is the airport, so that gives you some idea of the scale. It's 27 kilometers around. There is not a red line painted on the countryside. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a really nice place. The, the main CERN laboratory is actually this triangle of buildings here. Um, and then the rest of the experimental areas, it's about 100 meters underground uh, going around the countryside. And so it's called the Large Hadron Collider. It collides protons. Sometimes it collides other things like gold nuclei. Um, so it's not just a large proton collider. It collides other, other things made of quarks. It's 27 kilometers around. I'll show you a picture of what I mean about that in a minute, because if, we, trans we, if we transported it to South Bend, I'll give you some idea of the size. Um, the magnets that are required to steer the beams around actually run at two Kelvin, which is colder than outer space. It, it's a liquid helium temperature. We, uh, we collide bunches of, let's see, it would be, um, 100 billion protons on 100 billion protons. There are thousands of those, but they're very, very small. So it's uh, like shooting two needles at each other from really far away and having them hit head on. It's not really um, easy to do. It, it is really a truly international effort. Um, my experiment has 3,000 scientists on it. All overall, we have more than 10,000 from over 100 countries that work here. It's really interesting having Ukraine and Russia on the same experiment. Uh, we have Iran and the United States on the same experiment, um, but we all get along. Um, so this data collection started in 2009. Uh, then they doubled the energy almost. Uh, it, for a previous run, we ran from, we were shut down actually during COVID, which is probably good. Uh, and then the accelerator just came back on this spring. Um, and so we're just ramping up and collecting a little more data before the end of the year. Um, so some fun facts. Uh, the proton kinetic energy right now when the beams are circulating is 6.9 trillion electron volts. Now, what does that mean? If you wanted to do, if you wanted to get a voltage that big with uh, D batteries, and you stack them on top of each other, one on top of another, it's enough to go from here to the moon and back like 500 times. That's how many D batteries you need to get that. So it's, it's, it's a lot of energy. Um, they, the protons travel at 99.9999990% of the speed of light. It's actually easier to talk about, so they travel three meters per second slower than light. It's easier to, to, to count it that way. So they're going pretty fast. Um, so one of the things that they're, they're doing right now is to up the beam intensity. So trying to squeeze more protons in, uh, which means that we have more collisions. And so actually, when we pass these uh, 200, or, yeah, 200 billion protons through each other, um, we get about 40 collisions. So this, it's almost like a, two clouds colliding because protons are really small, but you still get almost 40 collisions in the detector at the same time. Uh, the total energy in the beam is almost 300 megajoules, and that's all carried by little particles whizzing around. Um, to put that into context, it's, it's the equivalent of a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier work moving at five and a half miles per hour, but it's all in a beam. So you don't want it to hit anything. Uh, and if you like ice cream, it's the equivalent of 24 kilograms of creamy chocolate peanut butter ice cream, a cold stone cream. There's a lot of energy in food. Um, okay, so those are sort of fun facts. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our experiment. So we have four major experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, Atlas and CMS are the two multipurpose ones, and LHCB and Alice or Alice or Alice or however you want to say it um, are sort of special ones, which I won't really talk about. Uh, so now if you move the, Notre, the, the Large Hadron Collider to Notre Dame, uh, so here is a an, you know, the sort of standard satellite Google photo of uh, the area here. So Notre Dame is here, and the LHC would be about this big. So it would go well into Michigan. It almost sort of follows the bypass and uh, the Capitol Expressway over here. So that gives you some idea of how big it is um, if you were to drive around here and, and, and kind of fit it in. 
Okay, so we work at this detector way over here, which is called the compact muon solenoid. That's what CMS stands for. Uh, I and four of my colleagues, actually another one just joined us, um, or will join us in January, work on this. And uh, so this is a giant particle physics detector, and I'll explain a little bit about what it looks like. Um, so it weighs 12,500 tons. It's about, I should have thrown in, I have a sort of model of it sitting in the Notre Dame Stadium to give you some sense of scale, which I should have put in here so you could see that. But anyway, um, it's, uh, I, have, I have lots of photos, so it, it's, it's big and heavy. Uh, and then our counterpart, Atlas, is much bigger, actually, size-wise. It's uh, almost 60% uh, wider. And so we have this, so the CMS stands for the um, compact muon solenoid. I think this is like a toroidal something, I don't know, whatever. Um, but there's mo this is mostly air. So if you wrapped Atlas in, in, in uh, plastic wrap, it would float, um, believe it or not because it's just so much volume with very little in it. The CMS would sink to the bottom because it's mostly just a solid hunk of iron. Um, so anyway, these are just uh, two different ways of doing part of it. And I'll explain a little bit about what, how this works. So yeah, ours is compact. It's 20% it's, it's of the volume, but twice the mass. So it's definitely sinking. Um, so the, what this is, is basically a digital camera the size of a cathedral. And so it's got 700, and, so this is a 70, 760 million pixel camera. Um, not, yeah, so, okay, I guess you can buy a, uh, a 50 megapixel camera, but it's not the size of a cathedral. Um, and so it has different layers, which I'll talk a little about in a minute, that help us to understand what kind of particles go, th and go through there. Um, here are some photos of it. So here's the, the guy up in a cherry picker to give you some scale. The cavern that it sits in is about the size of a football field. And it was assembled in slices above ground and then lowered into the cavern through this giant shaft. And I always like this picture because I was wondering like, what this guy's going to do. <laughs> He's not going to catch it. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I thought that was fun. So it was yeah, assembled in these big circular slices and lowered down into the cavern. Um, and so here you can see the beam pipe going through. That's where the protons go. And then this is one of the end caps uh, that fits into this piece here, so to close it up. Um, and somebody knows where all these wires go. I, I don't. But uh, someone carefully has routed all of those. So uh, a little bit about how these detectors work. So these are, like, these are like onions. We have all these different layers. Each of these different layers tells you something about the particles that are passing through it. Um, and so the reason why that we build them like this is because most of the inter interesting stuff that we want to look at doesn't live very long. Higgs bosons or W and Z bosons only live for 10 to the minus 20 seconds or even shorter. So they're not going to travel any distance at all. And the only way we can understand if they were there is to look at what they decay into and try to work effectively backwards in time to understand what happened in the collision. And in order to do that and piece together the decay products and re reconstruct what actually happened in the collision, we have to measure the energies and directions of the particles as precisely as possible so that we can combine them and try to put together and, and, this, and figure out what, where they actually came from. So we surround the interaction point. So here, this is a cross-sectional view. So the beam would be going into the board or out of the board. And the, the collisions would happen right here in the center. Then you have these thousands of particles come flying out. And they would pass through these different layers of the detector. And we measure where they go. And we try to measure all their energies. And then we can try to work backwards and understand what was produced in that collision. Um, so this gives you some idea of how this works. So this is actually a, this when I press go, is we're going to be a movie of how data accumulated when we discovered the Higgs. And so in this particular case, the Higgs boson, the, 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 the K that we're looking for is the Higgs boson can decay into all the particles. Here it decays to two Z bosons, and each Z decays to two muons. The Higgs and the two Zs only live for 10 to the minus 23 seconds, so we don't see them. So all we can see are these muon particles, which are like heavy electrons. Those are a little bit special because they come all the way out through the detector. They're very penetrating. In fact, you have muons raining through your body right now coming from cosmic rays made high up in the atmosphere, about you know, it's like um, 10 or so per centimeter per second. And so they're going, you can't see them. If I, I should have brought my little particle detector, we have one that we, we show them live. Um, um, Next time we do one of these talks, I should remember to do that. So what we do is we look at these muons and we say, hey, can I make a Higgs boson 
out of the muons that might be coming from these Zs. And when you do that, uh, you start to see things pile up. So this is the data that was accumulated while we were trying to discover the Higgs. And the stuff in blue and in green are the things that we know about. And we just keep watching this spectrum accumulate. And all of a sudden, you see that there's stuff happening here that's not blue or green, which means we don't know what it was. And so as, as time progresses, there's more and more evidence that there's something new happening in this particular spot. And then we get to this point, you're like, well, hey, it looks like there's something that's making uh, four muons, and if I put them all together and try to ask what mass that particle has, they all pile up in one place. So there's a particle of something like 125 masses here, and that's not part of the blue or green that we expected. So this is a signature that we're, we've made something new. So this was actually, yeah, so this is um, after the Higgs discovery was reported um, from the original run, and then when we go back and add a lot more data in 2020, it's fairly clear that there's, a new, that there's something new there that's not either of these blue or green things. And so this is the, uh, one of the signatures of the Higgs boson. That's how we find it. We looked for a, something that piled up at a mass, looking at all the decay products. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's how you see it. <coughs> um, and it's all of this detector technology and computing. So let me talk a little bit about computing. So when the, when the beams are colliding and we're looking at the data coming off this detector, we're, we're producing data at 100 terabytes a second off this detector. OK, so that's um, a lot. Uh, and we, can't, we can look at that data, but there's no way we can write it on anything, because that, that would be ridiculous. Um, we write data at about a gigabyte per second, so down by several orders of magnitude. Uh, so one year's worth of data for our experiment is about 15 petabytes. Um, and so just to give you some idea, like your typical laptop has a, a, like a terabyte disk drive in it. So this is uh, 15,000, am I doing that right? Yes. Um, 15,000 laptop disks for one, uh, one year of data. Um, so far, we've collected about 250 petabytes of data, which is sitting around. And to crunch all of this, we have built a worldwide computing grid that have sites scattered all over the place at different universities and different national labs that has about 400,000 computing cores running 24-7 to process this data. Um, so there's a lot of data crunching and moving uh, to, to get this science done. And one of the other things that's interesting is that, uh, as I, yeah, I could have a whole other slide about how rare the Higgs is and how you compare it to like grains of sand in an Olympic swimming pool, which is about the right analogy. So the, the, we, these are very rare signals, I, you know, the 250 petabytes of data. There are not very many Higgses. I showed you how many Higgses there were in there. There were like a few hundred out of uh, the giant trillions and trillions and trillions of collisions. So the signals that we're looking for are rare and they're hidden in these giant volumes of data. So one of the things that has come to the fore recently is looking at artificial intelligence and ways of sifting through this data and trying to find the signatures that we're looking for. Um, so we, you know, we work with our own homegrown things, but we have some interesting partnerships with, with industry, of course, because we have interesting problems, so they're interested to see what we have to say. And there are a lot of big data analysis techniques that people are working through to allow us to process this data much more quickly. Which this is going to be important because we're actually going to get 10 times much more data uh, coming down the pike here. So we have to figure out how to do this. It's still a work in progress. Um, yeah, so we, we alluded earlier to uh, the, the people. So this was at the 25th anniversary of the founding of this experiment. So these are not things that you pull off um, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, this is the uh, above ground hall where those big pieces were assembled and then, and then lowered from there. And this is a party that we had to celebrate the 25th anniversary. And uh, that's me right there. <laughs> so I was actually there. This is in Geneva. And this, this is a photo of the detector that wasn't really the detector sitting there. Um, so, it, so it does break down into more socially uh, adaptable groups. So, whoops. so this is the, uh, at CERN, when the Higgs boson was announced, this was kind of the group that was assembled. Many of these people were actually, there's an undergraduate, a few grad students, and some, pro some professors. Uh, kicking around there. Um, 
So this is almost the, the sort of full group. Um, I was actually in Australia at a conference, so I was not in the photo, but uh, it was fun anyway. Um, so this gives you some idea. We have some, some visitors from a different group over here, but in any case, um, there, this gives you some idea of our team at Notre Dame who, who work on this. Okay, so why keep going? We found this thing, um, but I should tell you that we're planning to run maybe to 2040 with this, with this experiment. So we've got another 20, 20 or 30, 20, 18 years to go. We're gonna collect almost 10 times more data. And so, you know, why didn't we just stop? We found the Higgs. But as I'll try to tell you, there are lots of questions that we don't understand to still be answered. And we have a really nice machine, so we're gonna try to get as much out of it as we can. So one of the questions is the Higgs mass. So, yeah, we can measure the Higgs mass really well. It's one of the most pre precisely measured masses in all of particle physics. So wh what's the question? Why, do we, why is this weird? And so one of the things that uh, I should tell you a little bit about is, so now I have to invoke quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, masses are tricky things um, because particles can turn into other things and anything that can happen will at, with some probability. So imagine that I had a ping pong ball that had some non-zero coupling to bowling balls. So while the ping pong ball is traveling, some of the time it turns into a pair of bowling balls and then turns back to a ping pong ball. It could happen, so sometimes it does. Now imagine if you're pushing on the ping pong ball, you, you know, just like the sailboats, if I push on this, it goes really fast. If I happen to push on the ping pong ball while it's two bowling balls, it's not gonna go very fast. So the fact that it does this some fraction of the time means that the, the, the bowling balls will change the mass of the ping pong ball. And the effective mass of, of the ping pong ball will be different than just the ping pong ball itself because it can turn into these bowling balls. So this is what happens to the Higgs too. The Higgs can turn into all kinds of particles. In fact, it can turn to all the particles that we know about. So the physical mass of the Higgs that we get by pushing on it is the, the mass of the ping pong ball basically plus all the corrections that happen for these other heavy things that the Higgs can touch. Now, the problem with this is that since the Higgs is basically coupling to anything in the universe, the things that the Higgs can touch can be really, really heavy. And so the Higgs mass should be really heavy, but it's not. We can see it. And so this is a very strange thing. The Higgs mass is about 125 proton masses, but these corrections should be basically infinity which means that this bare mass needs to be like negative infinity or slightly, slightly bigger than negative infinity so that we get something that's 125 GeV. So this is a, a very bad cancellation because I have two, basically two infinities adding up to a small number. So we don't like that. Physics, physicists do not like this. Uh, so you know, this tells you something wrong to understand. So, so you can imagine that if we played Michigan, it'd be a thousand. It, it's, yes, it's possible but it's not very likely. So the fact that we have two large numbers that are uh, equal and opposite to the two, then they should be infinity and they cancel to some really nice finite number, tells us that we really don't understand what's going on. Uh, and so we're trying to find some new physics that forces the mass to be what we actually measure. So this is a, a question. And so what we're gonna try to do is to poke at the Higgs boson. I told you that it couples to all the particles, so we need to study the couplings of the Higgs to understand if it's really doing what we think it's doing, or maybe that there's some other mechanisms in there that, that look at masses. So that's what we're gonna do this time. Um, another big question, what is the universe made out of? Well, we think that only about 5% of it is the stuff that's in this room, like this podium here. About another 27% is something called dark matter, um, which is dark, and we don't know what it is. And then if we were talking about the energy of the universe, the rest of it is this mysterious thing called dark energy, again, which we have even less of an idea what it is. So this is very mysterious because these are the, this is the piece we know and love, and there's still lots of bits about that that we don't understand. So this, this is sort of, you know, it's depressing, right? We, we only understand 5% of the universe and actually we don't understand that all that well either. So um, in any case, we're hoping to elucidate this. So let's talk about dark matter a little bit. We think it should be some kind of particle. Why? Because we can see it clumping. So it has to move around. Um, and we don't think it interacts with regular matter because we've tried really hard to see it interacting with regular matter and we don't. So it doesn't have, it doesn't have charge. 
Uh, it doesn't interact with nuclei very well. So maybe it has weak interactions, but they, should be, they have to be very weak. We know we can see it affecting things gravitationally, so it has to have gravitational interactions. But so far, we haven't been able to make it interact with anything we know about. Okay, so this may be a long shot, but uh, we're trying to understand how we could see dark matter. Now, yeah, so we, we, we don't think it inter interacts very much with itself or it would have kind of annihilated and gone away, but we can see it forming spherical clouds around galaxies. We can see the, the astrophysical uh, implications of it. So we don't know anything about dark energy, okay? It's, it's not a particle, it doesn't behave like that. It's probably negative pressure in the universe, which I don't understand, so don't ask me about it. Uh, it's, it's a property of empty space itself, um, maybe. So anyway, it's definitely causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate, but uh, we don't know, we have, we have no idea what it is. Okay, so we might be able to learn something about dark matter at the LHC. If it interacts weakly, we should be able to make it and, and, and see how it, and I'll show you a little bit about how that might look. So we might be able to make dark matter particles and see them um, or see, their ev see evidence of them. Now, the new theories of dark matter, we might have whole collections of dark matter. It may just not be one particle. There could be a whole dark sector that looked just like the one I showed you, except that it doesn't couple, it doesn't talk to regular matter at all. Who knows? Um, dark energy is a little more difficult. Some theories about dark energy postulate something like a Higgs field or a Higgs-like field that might, have, might actually do this. And so maybe we could find evidence of some other kinds of Higgs field. We don't, we don't really know. Um, again, that's really speculative. But we're going to look for it anyway, because we have the tool. So we have a hammer, and we're going to be looking for nails to hit with it. Um, and anyway, so but let me tell you how. So the best outcome would be something that answered all these questions. So let's say that uh, um, here is a theory that I'll explain to you called supersymmetry. And this idea is actually somewhat compelling. Here are the, here's the periodic table that I showed you earlier. So imagine that you double it, okay? It doesn't seem that outrageous. Um, but, and the only other thing that we do is we, uh, we swap spins. So those of you may remember from chemistry that electrons are spin a half. So in this theory, they're not, they're spin one. And these, then all of these force carrying particles are actually spin one, so over here they're spin a half. So you double the number of particles and you flip the spins. Seems plausible. Um, so the, the beauty, beauty of this, it turns out that they're the, when you do all of this, they have different opposite properties. So if I put in like regular top quarks here to figure out what the Higgs mass correction is, it could be, this would be a positive infinity. If I put the supersymmetry partners in here because of the whole spin business, you get negative infinity. So if those things happen to be, if both of these things happen to be here, then these corrections cancel out and the Higgs mass can be what we see. It doesn't have to be yanked up to be a really high number. So this gives you an, a natural, if you will, mechanism to have the, to solve the Higgs mass question. Could be. Um, one of the other nice properties of some of these models is that the lightest particle in the supersymmetric table that I showed you could be stable. And if it is, then it could float around the universe and, and be dark matter. And so you would be able to tell it was, we, we were able to see that we made it by seeing what was missing. So this is, this is not a dark matter event, but it would, be, it would kind of look like this. So this is, a, this is a reconstructed collision from the LHC. This little uh, blue line here is an electron that's pointing at this, all this energy that sma it smashed into uh, one of the calorimeters. <laughs> and on the other side, if I look opposite this, there's this green, whoops, there's this green arrow which is representing all the stuff that went missing because we didn't see anything. So, so if you look at this event display without the green arrow there, there's no energy on this side to balance this energy over here. So there's a bunch of energy missing. So that's the signature that something with a lot of energy left the detector and we didn't see it. So you could imagine that if I made dark matter, it would do the same thing. It wouldn't interact, it would just go away and I just have a lot of energy on one side and nothing over here. So that's one of the ways we could see things that aren't visible because we can see what they sort of balance against or not. So Susie could be the answer. Um, if this turns out to be the right theory, there are multiple ways of answering a lot of these questions. Uh, it turns out in a different sort of arena, 
supersymmetry and if you've heard of string theory, superstring theory, um, they, are, they kind of meld together. And so you, if that's the right answer, then that could actually explain where gravity fits in. We don't know. The optimist would say, well, if, we, if supersymmetry is right, we found half the particles already because they're the standard model particles. But um, anyway, that's a, it's kind of a silly statement. So um, now the problem is, is that we haven't seen this yet. And for supersymmetry to be the answer, some of the particles that will uh, change the Higgs mass and make it stable have to be light. And they're not there so far. So the, this is looking like not the best answer. Um, it's also like twice as many particles and more arbitrary. But the bottom line is we haven't seen it yet. So that's definitely a con for this particular theory. So who knows? Uh, we, we might actually get to see something completely unexpected. Um, there are lots of theories of what new particles could be out there. Um, and you know, we haven't really seen something truly unexpected for 50 years or something like that, even though we have these more and more advanced accelerators. So we've really been filling out the standard model, and so there's some hope, maybe, if we look uh, at all, underneath all the rocks, that we may find something that, we, that is truly new. Um, some of the, so the easy stuff that could explain a lot of these new, th new, new uh, phenomena that I talked about are, is not there. So we're looking harder and harder. Um, and maybe we're due for something completely unexpected. We really don't know. So, and this is again the optimist statement, everything we look for and don't find tells us what theories were wrong. So, you know, we're narrowing things down. But um, in any case, that's, that's not the best uh, answer to continue. Um, so anyway, we don't really know what we're going to find, um, but we're working on it. And so uh, that's all I've got here. So I'd be happy to take questions um, from, from all of you. So thanks. We'll see if this works. There we go. Um, any questions? We'll start with one at the front. Go ahead. So, so the question is, um, I, I mentioned that the Higgs was a scalar field. So scalar means um, that the, the Higgs, so particles have an intrinsic property called spin. An electron has a spin a half. Um, turns out quarks also have spin a half. Uh, the Higgs. Can you explain that? So, it, yeah, it's a quantum mechanical thing, so it really doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's kind of an arbitrary number, but it the, so the, the way that it, the way that it actually manifests itself is that if you um, if you do an experiment on an electron as it's moving, and you apply a magnetic field to it, it behaves as if it's spinning, which is why they call it spin even though it may not be spinning. It's, 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 a, it's an attribute of the particle itself. So it's an observation. It's an observation. But, but it, the, the, the electron has this intrinsic property. But it does behave as if it's spinning, which is why they call it that. So, but different kinds of particles have different intrinsic spin. The Higgs boson has no spin. And so that we call that a scalar. So it has spin zero. You can have spin one. You can have spin a half. You can have spin three halves. Um, and so it's just a, it's an intrinsic property of particles. We don't really know where it comes from. No, no. So they, they, we switched the ones and the ones and one halves for the supersymmetric particles. We just swap them. Okay. Yep. But yeah, no one knows where spin comes from, but you can see it if you do experiments on, on. Part. I know that they talk about that stuff related to the, the properties they have in hard drives now. Um, yeah, if you make the properties, if you make the, the uh, magnetic cells in your hard drive small enough, you start to, we, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting to the point where we do have to worry about quantum effects in, in hard drives. Eventually you get to, the, to that point. That's, that's exactly right. Other questions? Other questions? Yes, back there. Is the spin directional? Yes, the spin is directional, yeah. And so you can flip it. And so it, it, another thing you can think of, um, another analogy to spin, if you have um, polarized light, that's actually caused by uh, the photon spinning in some sense. And so circularly polarized light means that uh, the, um, the, the photon that's traveling is actually kind of corkscrewing along. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing. Oh, the way, oh yeah. So, so, the, so the question is, um, for the 
when we build these particle detectors, why are, why are there these? These are the offsets that you're talking about? Yeah, like everything's yeah. Broken. And so uh, they, they are. And the reason why we do it, build it that way is, um, well, there have to be little holes to get electronics and stuff out. And so what you do is you don't want to leave any gaps. And so we'll, we try to cover up the gaps that are here by putting some solid detector behind it and then so, so forth and so on. So you, the, the way that it's engineered, you don't, you, if, you, if you made it perfectly aligned, then there would be holes where things would get out. And so we try to stagger it so that we, we don't leave any gaps. Yeah. What is the yellow stuff? What is the yellow stuff versus the red stuff? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't talk through all the different parts of the detector. So I could kind of quickly, so it, here in the center, um, so we want to measure the trajectories of the particles and we want to measure their energies. And so anything that you put in the path of a particle, especially a charged particle, is going to cause it to lose energy because it's going to interact with the atoms in the material and it will cause it to wiggle and bend a little bit because it's, it's colliding when it's running through stuff. So if we could build a massless particle detector, that would be fantastic, but we can't do that. So, but we need, to, we need to measure the trajectories of these particles. And so what we try to do here in the very center is to measure the paths of the charged particles as they, as they leave the collision point. And in order to do this, we fill this volume with about three tennis courts worth of uh, 300 micron, so that's about the width of a human hair, maybe a little bit wider than a human hair, of, of silicon. So semiconductor silicon pieces that are about this big. And so we've tiled this entire region with silicon detectors. And they have um, lines, strips basically etched on them. So as the particles pass through them, they'll hit strips. And so then, then we play a giant game of connect the dots here to see where the particles have passed through the different layers of, whoops, different layers of this detector. We try to make it as thin as possible because we don't want the particles to scatter as they go out. Um, and then we start putting lots of material in the way. So this green thing is made, we, this, this will stop electrons and photons. Uh, it's made, these are made of crystals. Um, it's like a lead glass crystal. Well, it's lead tongue state, but we don't really need to care about that. There are crystals that are about this big, and there are about 40,000 of them uh, in the central part and another 30,000 in the ends. Um, and so those stop electrons and photons and measure their energy really precisely. So they deposit all, the, they, they kind of crash into there and deposit their energy. Outside of that, this purple thing is um, made up of layers of brass and plastic. And as other particles will hit there, they'll start to lose energy. We, we say they shower, they, they throw off lower energy secondaries and those throw off lower energy secondaries and you get something that looks like a shower. Um, and so this, we try to catch all the rest of the energy of, of everything else that's coming out in that layer. Actually, we built a bunch of this piece here um, at, at Notre Dame. Um, this gray thing is a superconducting solenoid. So it's a superconducting magnet. You can park a bus in it. Um, uh, it it's the largest, uh, largest ener stored energy in a, in a volume in the world. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's very large. And so that magnetic field causes these particles to bend, the charged particles to bend as they come out. So we can measure, the faster they're going, the less they bend. So if we measure the bend of the particles, we can figure out how fast they're going. Um, outside of all of this stuff, th these yellow things are more la layers of tracking interspersed with this orange stuff, which is iron. And so the only thing that makes it all the way out here are these mysterious muon particles, which are like electrons, only much, much heavier. And they go through all this material. Everything else gets stopped in the middle here. And so from this, yeah, I have another slide from which I can probably find that kind of shows the different particle types. So this allows us to tell where the particles went, how much energy they had, and then from the signatures that they leave in the detector, whether we were looking at electrons or muons or photons or some other kinds of particles going out. So it kind of gives us a complete picture of what happened in each of the collision. Each collision makes like a thousand particles. And so, um, and we, I didn't say this, but we collide, the beams collide every 25 nanoseconds. So we have 40 million collisions a second in this detector. So you can't buy a 76 megapixel camera that records data every 25 nanoseconds. That much I guarantee you. 
So the question is, everything moves in, yes, we're immersed in the Higgs field. Can, but you can't see gravity either. That's true. So, so I mean, that's, that's not a stupid question. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, it, uh, there's, it, it is really, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not really sure there's a good answer to that. Um, these, these forces are like permeate space and they're, they're there. So yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't really see electricity either. I like to think of it as, as sort of, a, it's almost like molasses, but it's molasses that's different depending on what you're moving through it. Because the, 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 it has, each particle has a different way of, so if I push on a really, a particle with a heavy mass, then that molasses is resisting it a lot. If it's, if it's a very light particle, then the molasses isn't resisting it as much. But, so it's somehow, it's like the, it is really like the, the keels and the boats uh, analogy where some things have, are not very um, aerodynamic. So when you push on them, it takes a lot of force to, to move them. Uh, some things are, and so they zip right along. And so I think that, that to me is, a, is a, I, I like that analogy because it really is kind of how it works. Um, so how would the black hole affect the Higgs field? So the, they're different things. Um, there may be some, so the question is how would the black holes, how would a black hole affect the Higgs field? So the, the energy that's in the black hole and the mass of the stuff that's in the black hole would be given mass by the Higgs field. So the mass of the black hole is something we can measure. That mass comes from the Higgs. It probably would, um, at, at these crazy high energy density values, you may get some really weird interactions between, uh, but yeah, that, I, don't, I don't know. That's, I'm an experimentalist, so I, I build these things and, and do this stuff. I, I've, that's, I, that's, that's above my pay grade. What, what, I was gonna say one, one final question, then we'll wrap up, and then you. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, well, okay, protons and neutrons are made up of quarks, for example. Is there another level down? Uh, there are some theories that postulate that there is another level down. Um, we keep looking for the other level down, but as far as we can tell, the quarks and, and um, electrons, for example, are point-like. They don't have substructure as far as we've been able to see. So we, we continually look. Every time we, get, we move the energy up, we look again to see if there's some evidence that there's some substructure, but it's, it, we haven't seen it yet. So I think the string theory postulates, for whatever, it postulates a million different things, but a lot of the things that string theory postulates is that there's much, much smaller things. But to access those, so you could think of the, the, these big particle colliders are like microscopes in some sense. And so instead of a telescope, it's like a microscope. And the higher energy of the beam that we make, the smaller the structure we can see. So it's like an electron microscope. And the, the, if I crank up the beam energy, I can see smaller things. It's inversely proportional. And so the bigger the microscope we bi build, the smaller the things we can see. But to get to, to access some of the things that are postulated by string theory, we need to build a collider the size of the Earth, basically, or maybe even bigger. So we're not there yet. That would be kind of expensive. So we haven't, we haven't gone there yet. Okay, let's thank Mike again. Thank you.